as we said before, I am Dave, and I am super pleased to be one of six total pastors here to be able to serve alongside uh, other faithful men is just a, a delight, and uh, they serve as examples to me. So I just wanted you to know that I'm thrilled to hear that <laughs> prayed for every every Sunday. What a joy it is to be part of this. It's also my privilege to bring to you God's Word today out of uh, Romans chapter 15. So if you grab your Bibles and turn there, I know some of you are expecting a uh, sermon based on the uh, the uh, uh, Christ triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but that will have to wait when we get there in Luke. So Romans chapter 15, 14 through 21. Let me, let me set the stage if I could. The, uh, the life of Saul of Tarsus was radically changed when he came face to face with Jesus Christ. The gospel realities in the Old Testament that he had long denied were confirmed by, to be true by the resurrected Jesus himself who confronted him on the road to Damascus. You probably know the story. Paul received a new heart that day. Uh, he was truly a changed man because Jesus, who is the good news, you know that Jesus is the gospel, right? Jesus, who is the gospel and who remade, who remade him into the apostle Paul, the greatest advocate for the gospel of Christ, probably in all of human history. Um, the reality of the gospel of Jesus shaped Paul's life. Christ shaped Paul's life. And Paul became an example to us to follow as a, as a pattern as followers of Christ, we heard it in the reading that was done earlier, we imitate Christ and we imitate those who imitated Christ. And Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.13, he said to Timothy, follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now, you and I have not been personally commissioned as apostles of Jesus Christ. I know that. I know that. Um, we may never be called to plant a church somewhere near the Mediterranean coast or around the Aegean Sea, uh, but if you and I have trusted in Christ, if we're, if we're saved people, our lives, just like Paul's, uh, have been shaped and are being shaped by the gospel in an ongoing way by the truth of the gospel. The gospel uh, by the gospel, I don't mean more. I don't mean a six-minute. Uh, walk through a tract with somebody that doesn't know Jesus yet. Although that is sharing the gospel, right? Uh, as long as the gospel truth is there. But what I, what I mean is uh, because the gospel is the full message of God's word, Jesus is predicted. He is the predicted good news of the Old Testament. Jesus incarnated is the good news of the Gospels. Jesus followed is the good news of the book of Acts. And Jesus return is the good news of Revelation. The whole Bible, in a real sense, is the Gospel. And, and, and it's the entirety of this good news about Jesus Christ as realized by faith in Christ that shapes our life from new birth to glory, right? Okay. And that's the main point of the message passage today. It's this. The gospel shapes our lives. I bet you already have it memorized. The gospel shapes our lives. Thank you. So as we'll see in today's text, the gospel shapes our lives in at least four ways. And we're going to see that today. So if you're willing and you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Romans 15, we're going to read verses 14 through 21. Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. Paul says this about the Roman church. He says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. By word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I should build on someone else's foundation. 
But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Will you pray with me? Lord, simply uh, help us to understand your word. Uh, use me to make it clear. Help me to get out of the way. Um, Lord, we need to hear from you. Uh, we need to hear the sweetness of your gospel and how it changes our lives. So please bring that home to us, home to us all as a church family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. See if you all remember. The gospel, very good. The gospel shapes our lives. A gospel-shaped life. We're going to see four things that are true about it. Look at, verse, the, the, in verse 14, we see the very first uh, characteristic of a gospel-shaped life. And, and it all starts with R because I'm a guy that likes to repeat letters to help me remember. But a gospel-shaped life realizes the need to retain gospel truth. Realizes the need to retain gospel truth. I probably could have said that more elegantly, but it wouldn't have started with R. Look at verse 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God. And he goes on. I myself am satisfied. What is he saying? I, I'm confident in you Roman believers, I, I'm certain, I, I'm really persuaded, I'm convinced about something, about you, my brothers. And, and the, the, the Greek word for brothers here can mean just men, but in this case it means everybody in the church, brothers and sisters. I'm confident about y'all because he's talking to the entire Roman church. Uh, uh, and, and that's the case here. And, and, and this term is an affectionate one. He's speaking to them as people he cares about, that he really loves. You know, even though Paul ha has never personally visited the Roman church uh, in Rome, Paul knows a number of their members, and we'll see that in chapter 16. He's close to a number of them. Uh, but Paul's tenderness, his brotherly affection extends to the entire church, to everybody. Why? Because in Christ, they're all part of his Christian family. Uh, he addresses them as their brother, and even, even though he was personally commissioned by Christ as an apostle, I mean, he's got authority, but he addresses them as their brother to let them know that he understands that they, as a whole, are spiritually mature. They're a spiritually mature body of believers. Now, doesn't that sound a little weird in your ears, considering all the stuff he's been saying to them over the past several weeks as we've been looking at this, this book of Romans? He lets them know that he knows that they're grown up and that he wants them to know that he recognizes their maturity in Christ. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you, you yourselves are, and he lists three things. You're full of goodness, you're filled with all knowledge, and you're able to instruct one another. What does he mean by that? Well, uh, Paul knew that they were full of goodness, and that, that's speaking of moral goodness, um, that made them both a kind and a generous group of believers they, they cared for each other, and he's, he's committing them for that. Um, they were truly concerned for each other's welfare. And more than that, he says they were filled with knowledge. And, and, and as uh, Douglas Moo points out, he says this. Uh, he says that means that they had a comprehensive knowledge of the Christian faith. Does that surprise you to hear that, considering what we've been hearing in Romans up till now? They have a, they're not wet behind the ears in their walk. They're, 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 they're not new covenant newbies. You know, they're, they're not freshmen in the faith. They have a good grasp on the gospel. They're mature believers with a solid hold on apostolic teaching. In fact, Paul also confirmed that their grasp of scriptural truth made them, that it was so good that it made them competent to instruct one another. That word in the Greek is really strong. They were able to admonish and correct one another, to bring the scriptures to bear, to counsel one another on each other's lives. Wow. Now, now think about this. Why would Paul write such a lengthy letter um, about so many foundational gospel topics with even a bunch of correction in it if the Roman believers had a comprehensive knowledge of the Christian faith? And if that comprehensive knowledge of the Christian faith was so mature that they could serve as biblical counselors for each other. I mean,
Remember, as we've studied Romans, we've seen Paul teach about such heavy-duty topics as human guilt for sin and the need for God's righteousness and justification by faith alone and Christ alone, which brings reconciliation to God. And Paul also wrote about how the gospel transforms how we live, how the power of sin is broken, how the requirements of the law have been fulfilled, how the Holy Spirit empowers us to live for God's pleasure and no longer serving the desires of the remaining desires of the flesh within us. Paul also wrote about how God would bring the gospel first to the Jews and that most of them would reject salvation through faith in Christ and that God would then turn to bring the Gentiles into his family of faith before cleansing remnant Israel in the future from their sins too. And and, then Paul also wrote about how the gospel or those who believe it transforms us into the image of Christ and keeps us from being conformed to the ways of the world as we continually give our lives as living sacrifices in daily worship to God. This is a lot. I'm just kind of reviewing Romans. This is what he's been telling them. And, and how fellow believers, especially with whom we have disagreements over secondary, secondary issues, how we can love each other in the midst of all that. And that's just a snapshot of what Paul has been teaching these people. Just one. I'll be honest with you. That forces me to ask a question. Did Paul really mean it when he said to them, y'all are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. I mean, he's just buttering them up. Is that what he's doing? Is he just trying to get them to listen a little bit longer? Some, some scholars think so. I don't. Uh, didn't the tensions between the Jewish and Gentile believers contradict this idea of them being full of goodness? Uh, and, and didn't the Jewish judges of the Gentiles and the Gentiles devaluing their Jewish brothers prove that they weren't really full of goodness and knowledge after all? Isn't Paul just exaggerating a bit just to butter them up so they won't tune him out, right? Did Paul really mean the good things he said about the Romans? Were they really full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another? I mean, really? Is this just hyperbolic language to get them to hear a little bit more? Well, uh, the short answer is no, it's not hyperbolic. And did he mean it? The answer is yes, he sure did. And this should help us understand something about the church and about ourselves as individuals. Think about this. First, about the church, we should recognize that all of us should strive for a comprehensive knowledge of the word. We should all strive to that kind of knowledge. We must learn how the gospel transform lives, transforms lives in both salvation and ongoing sanctification so that we all could become competent to counsel one another in life's issues. That should be something we should be aiming for. Biblical counseling is not just for a certified someone who has a piece of paper on his wall. Um, it's not just the job of pastors or some paid counselor guy. Uh, biblical counseling, which is really focused discipleship, Um, is something we should all do for each other. God's word can make you and you and even me competent to counsel. All of us elders want our church to become the kind of church where we continue to grow in goodness and knowledge to the point where we're a church full of biblical counselors. And all that means is biblically prepared people to apply the word. That's it. That's all that means. Not fancy. It's just another way of saying we want to be a church full of wise, mature believers who know how to apply God's word to life. But the fact that Paul commends the Roman church for their goodness and fullness of the gospel knowledge, and yet needs to teach them about many of the basics of the gospel, should tell us something about ourselves too. What's that? Well, to live out the truths of the gospel, we're always going to need reminders. We're always going to need to be refreshed in knowledge of the gospel. And everything that comes about as a result of the gospel so that our goodness and our competency can continue to be there and to grow, right? Why? Because no matter how mature we become, we always need reminders of the truths that shape our lives. You know, I'll be honest with you, the older I get, the more this becomes reality to me. Um, I feel like I've forgotten more than I presently know. And I need to regularly review what I used to know so I can know it now. Amen? Amen. Yeah, everybody over 50 is like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> over 40 is like, I'm starting to get it. 30 is like, I don't get it at all. <laughs> don't worry, you will. When it comes to the word of God, the gospel and all of its accompanying truths 
Nothing could be more critical to growing in Christ-likeness than meditating on and thinking deeply about the only truths that have the power to transform. That's why Paul says, I myself am satisfied about y'all, my brothers, sorry, about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder. But, so in contrast to this goodness, this knowledge, this counseling prowess that they have, Paul knew that they were in need of something more. They needed a bold reminder on some points, uh, on some parts of the gospel reality that should be shaping their lives, but apparently isn't in the way that it needs to at that moment. And, 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 And it should be making them even more like Christ than they are at present, but for this to happen, they need to be reminded. The Greek word needs to be reminded again. (laughs) That's kind of repetitive. It's like he, like we need to be reminded multiple times or someone. You know, something you already knew needs to be brought into your mind again so that the truths that you were taught in the past might once again fill your mind and heart and shape how you live in public and private and in church. The need for gospel reminders are everywhere in the New Testament, everywhere. Paul says to Timothy, in Cor- he sent Timothy to Corinth, and what did he say to him? Remind them of what the Christian life really looks like. That's a loose paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 4, 17. Paul commanded Timothy himself to remember Jesus Christ. Like, you could forget Jesus? <laughs> but he's telling me, you gotta remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. The offspring of David is preached in my gospel, 2 Timothy 2.8. And then Paul commanded Timothy to remind the whole Ephesian church about the gospel truths they needed to live by in 2 Timothy 2.12. But it wasn't just Paul that was onto this idea of we gotta remember. The apostle Peter reminded believers scattered throughout the, what is now known as modern day Turkey about the essential nature of the very great and precious promises Gospel promises by which God's own nature is increasingly expressed in our lives and by which sinful desires are put to death. uh, That's 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8. In fact, Peter knew that retaining these truths was so essential to the Christian life that he told them, therefore, I intend to always remind you about these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. There's no getting away from it. We, we need constant reminder of the gospel truth. We need it to grow. I, I could go on. Would you like me to? Yes. Probably not. Because it's going to be a long sermon anyway. I could go on with many other examples. The believer's reality is this. The gospel shapes our lives, but this doesn't end with simply coming to faith in Christ. It is an ongoing process. Sanctification continues throughout our lives. And and the means of our transformation is the truth of God's word. Yes, when the spirit of God regenerates a sinful heart, a real change happens. When he grants the faith and repentance necessary to turn to Christ, and we actually receive Christ as Lord and Savior, the means that God uses to bring us to Christ in faith is the gospel, and there is a true transformation that happens at conversion. You're not the same when you get saved. You can't be. (laughs) You, you, You really do change. Um, but the changes don't stop there. Yeah, a new creature is birthed and the old life passes away, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Our attitudes, our affections, our motivations change when we get saved and as a result, so do, our, so do our actions, but there is an ongoing change that continues to take place. There are old sinful patterns of thinking and acting that remain. Can I get an amen? Yeah, this happens. Uh, Because although the power of sin is broken in our lives, the presence of it still remains, right? And it must be conquered, must be conquered. Every thought must be taken captive to serve Christ, 2 Corinthians 10.5. And the process of transformation into ever-increasing obedience to Christ continues. It's a process. As you say around here, process. The gospel and all of its truth shapes our lives in Christ from beginning to end. From beginning to end. And that means that we are in constant need of refreshment in the truth of the gospel. No matter how old we are in the faith or how mature, there's always more to know. There's always more to rejoice in. And there's always more goodness to have and to be lived out 
And the process of transformation continues, so we will always need to be reminded of essential truths. You know, I, I lo- it's so much fun for me to sit, like in the last several weeks, uh, I, not this one, I had to teach another class, but sit while Sean teaches or while one of the other uh, pastors teach because I just get refreshed. And I get jazzed up because I get to hear those truths all over again from somebody else's mouth and, and, and to just impress themselves into my heart once again. And, I, and it just causes me to rejoice and it changes my life. Paul knows that. And so he writes to the Roman church, on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder. Why? Because of the grace given me by God. What moves Paul to reemphasize and reapply truths they've already learned in the past? What, What moves him to do that? God's grace. The grace of God. Grace had so transformed Paul's life that he was absolutely devoted to bringing the gospel to as many people as possible and to reminding those who already believed in Christ through the gospel how it should shape their lives. God's grace is poured out on us when we are reminded again of the gospel truths that made us love Jesus and make us like Jesus. The gospel shapes our lives, and a gospel-shaped life, one realizes the need to retain gospel truth. And number two, a gospel-shaped life represents Christ for the sanctification of others. Represents Christ for the sanctification of others. Look at verse, the second half of verse 15 into verse 16. Paul says, On some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me my God, by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And by the way, the Roman church is mostly Gentile, right? So he, God's given me grace to minister to y'all. That's what he's saying to them. To be a minister of Christ Jesus of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. God poured out his grace upon Paul and empowered him to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable. So let me if I haven't already, draw your attention to the words minister, priestly service, and offering. Uh, all of those words, the Greek words from, that are translated into those English words, all picture a high priest or a priest worshiping God through offerings. That's what he pictures, right? And he's using this language intentionally. Think about it. In the, in the Old Testament, animals were sacrificed to cover over the sins of God's people so that they might be cleansed and be made acceptable for a relationship with God. And, and all those sacrifices ultimately find their fulfillment. They picture, they look forward to what? Christ's sacrifice once for all on the cross. When Christ gave his life on the cross for the sins of all who would ever believe in him, Christ's sacrifice completely washed away the stain and guilt for every sin we ever have or ever would commit. Christ's self-offering removes the need For any other substitutionary sacrifice, he's accomplished our salvation forever. Yet, because God has already poured out his mercy upon us in Christ, we are called, remember, Romans 12, 1. What does it say? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, right? Romans 12, 1. 1 Peter 2, 5 calls all believers a holy priesthood who offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, we give our lives daily in obedience to God as an act of worship, right? The gospel that saved us is also the gospel that motivates us to worship in action. And Paul, in a similar way, sees himself as a priest who brings these living sacrifices to God. Who are they? The Gentiles, the Roman church. How does he bring them to God? By sharing the gospel with Gentiles. Paul brings them to God and by continuing to remind them of the gospel, just like an Old Testament sacrifice had to be pure to be acceptable, the Gentile believers are made clean through faith in Christ when they hear the gospel and believe and when the gospel continues to refine and sanctify them through the power of the Spirit. You see, because they have believed in the gospel message which Paul preached, these same Gentile believers were sanctified by the Holy Spirit and are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. They were set apart from God and continued to be made more holy, practically speaking, day 
after day after day as the truths of the gospel continued to work their way out into their lives. Uh, am, I, am I making any sense at all? Just try to see if, if y'all are with me. All right, just check in. In the last chapter of Isaiah, the prophet looked forward in time to the future return of Christ. When believing Gentiles, get this, they will bring the precious remnant of God's believing people, the Jews, as an offering to God. That's Isaiah 66, 20. And in a very similar way, what Paul, that's why Paul does what he does. He, he wants to bring people from every nation as a pleasing offering to God so that they too can be set apart for God, be made holy. And through the gospel, by the regenerating power of the spirit and by the power of the gospel, continuing to sanctify them, they would be made more and more holy over time. That's how sanctification works. And that's true for them then, and it's true for us now, right? So for Paul, the gospel of Jesus wasn't just something with which you merely agree, um, not just a set of facts about who Jesus is and what he did on the cross that you believe to be true. No, no. Oh, by the way, those facts are true, and you must believe in them to be saved. Don't get me wrong. No, for Paul and for everyone who believes, the gospel is both the means of salvation, but it's also the means of both initial and ongoing transformation. Because those whom the gospel comes in knowledge, in belief, and in trust, reliance, that begins the journey and the journey continues forward. The gospel continues to change us. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. Notice that? Ongoing life comes from the gospel. In reality, gospel birthed faith is active. It changes how we live. And we who have been changed through faith in Christ recognize that others need the gospel too. You know that other people need the gospel, right? So that person to the right, they need the gospel. Person behind you, they need the gospel. Whether they're saved or not, person to the left, they need the gospel. And the person in front of you needs the gospel. And the person sitting in your seat needs the gospel, right? I think that's all of it. The gospel shapes our lives. And we have a responsibility to bring the gospel to others so that they might know the joy of being cleansed from their sins through faith in Christ. In fact, each of us shares that same responsibility. I can prove it. Jesus gave it to his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And frankly, we're all called to share the gospel so that others might be saved and sanctified. What did Jesus tell them? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. By the way, that includes sharing the gospel. Baptizing them, which pictures the cleansing, sanctification of being joined to Christ by faith. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And if you just stop there, that would just probably be for those disciples. But he goes on to say, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So since Jesus promised to be with them and with us until the end of the age in connection with making disciples, this must mean that the mission doesn't end until the age is over. And I'm thinking the age is still going on. We're all to live lives shaped by the gospel. We're all to live life shaped by the gospel. That's why we evangelize. That's why we disciple new believers to move them towards maturity. And that's why we support missionaries to do the same thing in other lands. That's the motivation behind it. Christ did not claim us as his own so that we should live for ourselves. He saved us to live gospel-shaped lives, which share the gospel of Christ with others so that he might sanctify them too. So, just remember, those who live gospel-shaped lives realize the need to retain gospel truth and continually be reminded of it, right? And number two, re they represent Christ for the sanctification of others. In other words, they bring the gospel to other folks so they might be cleaned up, right? And those who live gospel-shaped lives, number three, recognize God as the sole power for ministry. God is the sole power for ministry. Look at verse 17. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I'll not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. 
by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. All of the disciples chosen by Christ to lay the foundation for the church, of all of them, the Apostle Paul had the most far-ranging ministry. The, the furthest reaching influence, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. See Galatians 2, 7 through 9. Uh, his multiple journeys extended north from Jerusalem um, and, and, and away westward through modern Turkey, crossed the Aegean Sea into Achaia, north to Macedonia, and all the way up to the very borders of Illyricum, which is actually present day Albania. I mean, and, and he did loopy. Uh, Travels throughout that whole region over and over and over again. I mean, my goodness, was he busy. In every area, Paul would, would seek out an influential city to evangelize so that when enough people came to Christ, a church could be planted, a church could be established, so that it would continue to spread the gospel in that same area after Paul left. To, and, and he would leave to plant another church in another area, but he'd, he'd make sure to send others back so, so that they could continue to build on the foundational work that he started, right? He laid the foundation of the gospel, Jesus Christ. People got saved. Church was built. He'd move on to do it again and send other folks back to help build on that foundation, right? So look at verses 17 through 19. Paul, Paul knew He'd successfully planted many churches. He'd seen countless numbers of Gentiles come to faith in Christ through the gospel. Yet, Paul knew that he was not the source of his own success. Paul recognized that God was the sole power for ministry. 17, it says, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by, by power, signs, and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, modern-day Albania, <laughs> um, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Did, by the way, did that mean that there was no more gospel necessary? No. I mean, he was successful in doing what God had called him to do, to lay the foundation of the gospel in each major city, so then that church there could branch out and continue to share the gospel and remind one another about what the gospel is, right? right? The gospel had shaped the course of Paul's life. And Paul was proud of, of himself, no, of what Jesus had done through him. Um, he genuinely worked hard, but he boasted only in Christ because he knew that everything that had been accomplished was achieved by Christ's power and not his own. The Gentiles had been brought to obedience, which is just another way of saying that they came to faith in Christ, because obedience always comes along with true faith, right? Um, the Gentiles had been brought to obedience, and Paul knew that God was accomplishing the salvation of these Gentiles through him, and, and he lists three ways. By word and deed, in other words, through what Paul said and did, by the power of signs and wonders. And it's interesting, the word for sign refers to something that points to its source. So a sign is a miracle that points to God as its source, right? And a wonder is the same miracle that's absolutely unforgettable and causes you to marvel, so you can't get it out of your mind. So when he says signs and wonders, he's talking about miracles that the Holy Spirit would do through him that pointed to God as the source and confirmed the gospel message he was sharing. And they were so amazing, you couldn't forget them. Signs and wonders. So Paul knew that God was accomplishing the salvation of Gentiles through him by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders. And this was all done only by the power of the Spirit of God. None of it came from him. And in all of his many journeys to build churches from Jerusalem to Illyricum, God ensured that Paul's ministry was successful. Doesn't mean it was always easy. I just have to read Acts to know that one through. But churches were planted. The seeds of the gospel would continue to bear fruit in the lives of believers and in the lives of those with whom they would share the gospel long after Paul was gone. But in everything, Paul recognized the hand of God. And that's why he wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God made it grow. In truth, a miracle is always necessary when somebody gets saved. 
It's always a miracle when somebody gets saved. To change a sinner into a saint takes a divine work of God because sinners never turn to Christ apart from the miraculous, regenerating work of the Spirit. Only those whom God the Father draws to his Son come to his Son, John 6, 44. Only those who are given the divine gifts of faith and repentance will ever choose to follow Christ because salvation is entirely from beginning to end an act and a work of God. Praise God. That's why we're saved. The Apostle John reminds us that everyone who receives Christ by faith, all who believe in his name, become children of God only because of God's will to save them. John 1, 12 and 13 says so. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Our boast is in the Lord, never in ourselves. All, all human pride, all human boasting in ourselves is shut down by the gospel. The gospel makes humble people. And if you're feeling proud, you need to hear the gospel again. <laughs> and so do I. Because we come to realize that God saved us. And that even the faith to believe by which we trusted in Christ was a gift of his grace. And Paul knew that when he preached the gospel and people got saved and he was able to establish churches in every city to which the spirit directed him to go that he could honestly say, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. But Paul knew that God did it all, right? And he gave God all the credit publicly. You heard it. He's still giving God the credit. Paul indeed shared the gospel far and wide. Paul worked hard, but he knew that Christ was working powerfully within him. Colossians 1.29. Yet when God authenticated Paul's message with signs and wonders and brought heart conviction of their need for Christ through the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 1.5, God did these miracles so that the faith of the Gentiles might not rest in the wisdom of men like Paul, but in the saving power of God. 1 Corinthians 2.3-5. Okay, you and I are not apostles of Jesus Christ. Let's just admit that. We're not. We're not. But we are called by Christ to bring his gospel to the world. And like Paul, whose life was shaped by the gospel, we must, with him, recognize and rest in the fact that God is the sole power for ministry, not in ourselves. I mean, if this sermon does any good for anybody, clearly it's got to be God. And it's the same thing about everything we do in the Christian life, is it not? The gospel shapes our lives so that we realize the need to retain gospel truth so that we represent Christ for the sanctification of others so that we recognize God as the sole power for ministry. And he makes one more point. Number four, so that we respond to the needs of others with gospel truth. So that we respond to the needs of others with gospel truth. Look at verse 20. Paul says, and thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it's written, those who have never heard of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. Let me say it again. As it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. So Paul starts with, and thus, in verse 20. You could say it this way, therefore, right? because Paul had been reborn by the power of the gospel and because he realized that gospel truth must be retained in the hearts and minds of others and that he must seek the sanctification of others. Therefore, he responded to the needs of others by bringing them the gospel, knowing that God would empower it. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. He had one overriding desire, one central driving aspiration one prime directive given to him by God to preach the gospel. And he desired to do this not where Christ had already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. This isn't a prideful statement, by the way. Paul's not like refusing, you know, saying, hey, it's not any good if somebody else lays the foundation. That's not it. He was called to take, as a church planter, to take the gospel where the gospel had never been. And he desired to do this. Paul strove to take the gospel to areas where, where the people didn't know about Christ, where there'd been no previous gospel work to build on because the areas where the churches had already been established already had a means for the gospel message to continue going out through the members of the church. 
Wait a second. Is there a gospel church established in Albuquerque? Oh. So you, Paul's probably not going to put one next door, right? Because the means of the gospel going out to Albuquerque is already right here. At least to the northeast area, right? Is that fair? Okay. Paul knows what Christ has commissioned him to do because he was called to do the foundational work, to evangelize unbelievers, to plant churches from those who came to faith so that others could continue the work after he left. And he did this, get this, in partial fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 52. And he quotes it. Isaiah 52, 15. He quotes it. But as it is written, and actually he quotes it out of the Septuagint, by the way, that's why there's a slight difference in the wording. Um, but he says, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. Isaiah 52 is the prelude to Isaiah 53. Both of them speak about Christ coming to give his life for the salvation of those who had repented their sins. Isaiah 52 ends by predicting the crucifixion of Christ and that it will result in the cleansing of people, get this, from many nations. And that those who had never been told of Christ will see the truth with the eyes of their heart. And those who have never heard of it will come to understand Paul's life was shaped by the gospel. He'd been radically saved by Jesus and he'd been commissioned to take the message of faith in Jesus to the surrounding Gentile nations so that they could see, so that they could hear, so they could understand who Christ is and why they need to put their faith in him. Why did, why did Paul do this? It's because of who Jesus is. Jesus is the gospel. Who is Jesus. Who is Christ Jesus? He's the fully divine Son of God who also became truly human. He was born as a baby, growing up as a man, yet without sin. He obeyed every commandment we rebelliously broke, and he denied every sinful temptation that we gave into so that he could offer himself as a spotless sacrifice in our place so that he could take the wrath of God for our sins upon himself Take the wrath for all of our law-breaking upon himself. He hung on the cross to save sinners like you and me because the sins of all who had ever trust him were placed on him as if they were his own and God punished him as if he was the sinner, not you and me. All of the wrath for those sins was poured out on Christ and God's justice against those sins was completed. Christ gave up his life and was raised from the dead on the third day, proving that God's wrath towards those for whom Christ died was satisfied. For whom did Christ die? Only for those whom God would draw to faith in his son. Those whom the spirit would open their eyes to the reality of their sin before a holy God. The reality that they deserve eternal death in hell for that sin. But he died for those whom he would redeem. And he redeemed them through his death. And they come to Christ by the drawing of the Spirit. Willingly abandoning their sinful ways to trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. Because they now see they now understand. They get it. They know who he is. And they know without him there is no life. Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Do you understand the penalty due you for your sin? Do you understand that you cannot save yourself by good works? You can't. Because salvation is a gift which cannot be earned. It can only be received by faith. Will you turn away from your sinful self-rule and turn obediently to Christ? Publicly acknowledging him as your savior and as your Lord. Why? Because you believe that God has raised him from the dead and he is who he says he is and he came to do what he came to do. 
With the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Romans 10.10. And in Luke 12, 8 and 9, Jesus said that everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, that's Jesus talking about himself, I also will acknowledge before the angels of God, but the one who denies me before, before men will be denied before the angels of God. I urge you to confess, to believe, and be saved today. Confess your faith in him in prayer today. Don't wait. And then confess your faith publicly. You can receive no greater gift than the salvation that Christ offers. Than the, he is the gospel. He is the good news. Apart from him, there is only bad. If you reject the truth of the gospel, you reject the only hope possible for your eternity. Which will you choose? Will you cling to your old life and ultimately die without Christ and face the eternal wrath of God in hell for your sins? Or will you allow Christ to rule over your life, shape it by his truth, and know his love for eternity? Which will you choose? I urge you, give up everything to have Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's totally worth it. Let me end by simply stating this for believers. The gospel shapes our lives so that we realize we have a need to retain gospel truth. We need to be reminded of it regularly. We also recognize that we represent Christ for the purpose that others might be sanctified. And we recognize that God is the sole power for anything good that comes from our ministry to other people. And we've learned that we need to respond to the needs of others, whether they be believers that need to be reminded of truths or unbelievers that need to hear them for the first time. We respond to their need with gospel truth. Let's pray. Thank you for the saving gospel, Lord. Thank you that you brought these truths to us, that you opened up our eyes and our hearts to understand your holiness and our unworthiness, your righteousness and our sinfulness, our inability to save ourselves and your willingness to save us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you willingly came, that you bore sins that were not your own upon the cross so that you could save those for whom you died. Lord, I pray that you'd use these simple words to bring home eternally someone today. Cause them to trust in Christ. And for those of us that already do, help us to live gospel-shaped lives. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.